Nice here with another color theory video. I'm on the bakery server and this is a piece of art by Wordle. There is a huge amount of shading being done and most of the pieces are meant to be viewed at a distance. When working like this, you can think of each of the blocks as basically one pixel and the color is the mean average. And it's what most people think of when they say average. There are many ways to determine an average color. Individual colors are defined by sets of values, usually something like red, green, and blue, hue, saturation, and brightness, or red, green, and yellow, blue. All of these values in the different formats define this purple color in front of me. To get an average for a set of colors, you could sum all the values of each channel together. Images are composed of multiple colors, but the important part is how those colors are physically distributed to make the image. And in Minecraft, if you are decorating a build that people are going to see up close, then all of the colors in the block can matter. This is a problem that I have been messing with for a while now, and in this episode, I am going to spend some time talking about image segmentation, clustering, and how to determine the dominant colors for blocks and images. I recently added a median selector to the color world, and I want to talk about why I'm not happy with it, and why I'm changing it to use mean shift clustering. And at this point, I realize that I have probably thought about Minecraft color theory more than most people, and doing things to this detail is complete overkill. But it's a fun little problem to dig into, and I'm bringing you along with me. To get on the same page, let's look at the common averages mean, median, and mode. Here is a random set of numbers. If we add them all up and divide by the number of values, you will get the mean average, 36.13 repeating. This isn't the best value if you want to represent the most common values because there are some really high values on the end that skew the data. This is why you hear things like median household income on the news, because the ultra rich skew the data if you were just using the mean income. To calculate the median, you average the numbers from smallest to largest, and then the number in the middle is your median. For us, it's 19, and this represents the bulk of our data. Most of our values fall close to 19. And there's also mode, which is just the value that is most common in your data. It's useful for many things, but not really for us. So let's apply these to colors and images and see where the issues are. I'll use the cornflower for this because it has a small number of pixels, but this will apply to all textures and images. I'm also gonna use RGB for this because people are familiar with it, but this applies to any color format. We can line up each pixel and see their red, green, and blue values. And if we averaged each channel, we would get the average color, which ends up being this bluish gray. If you were gonna be decorating with this, you're probably more interested in either the blue or the green. Let's try the median color and see if that's a little bit more representative. To do that, we'll take our red channel and organize it from smallest to largest and then pick the middle value, and then do the same thing for the green channel, and then finally doing it for the blue channel. And you might see the issue here that we have two values from the blues and one from the greens. These values together make the median color, which is almost exactly the same as the average color. If we compare it to our cornflower here, it's not really representative of any of the colors present. I also did this in OK Lab as well, and you get even grayer colors. And you might be thinking, why don't you take these average colors and then just use the closest actual color out of the texture? Let's check that out. I can display all of the colors in the OK Lab space, and I'll display the averages and the medians as circles. The closest existing color is this one light purple pixel in the base of the flower which is probably the least representative color you could pick out of this whole texture. Let's take a look at orange terracotta. Neither its average or its median color is really that close to the dominant colors. And the main reason we are having these issues is that this block is multimodal. There is more than one group of color. For this, I would say that there are three colors, the orange, the blue, and then maybe the white. And basically every Minecraft block that isn't monochromatic is multimodal, and these averaging techniques have issues representing multimodal data. So how do we fix this? What I wanna know is what is the dominant color, but also what groups of colors are present. We basically want to find the groups of similar colors and then find their average. Basically reducing the total number of colors in the image, but still retaining the overall look of the image. Back to the cornflower, I would say that this could be easily divided into blue and green. You might think, wouldn't you just wanna see what pixel color is most abundant and that's the dominant color, but that's not the case. 
that would be the mode. And like we saw earlier, most abundant doesn't necessarily mean it represents the data very well. Usually the dominant color isn't exactly one color, but a group of colors that are relatively close. Which finally brings us to the point of the episode, image segmentation or quantization and clustering techniques. Posterization is a common method used to reduce the colors in an image, and it usually works pretty well. Median cutting is the common technique to do this, so let's try that on the cornflower. We can display our pixel values again and calculate the range of each channel. This is just the max minus the min, and our blue channel has the biggest range. So first we start by organizing the pixels from smallest to largest on just that channel. We find the median value, which is just the middle, and separate the pixels into two groups. From there, we calculate the average of each group, and that becomes our median cut. We can apply those colors back to the flower, and it looks pretty good. If we wanted three colors, we would look at the biggest group, which is the blue section down here for us, and we look at the range, and the largest range is the red section. We organize our pixels from smallest to largest via the red. We divide that in two, and then we average those colors. And this is what we get. Still looks pretty good. Same thing if we wanted to do four. The green channel happens to have largest range and it's actually already organized from smallest to largest. So we'll divide it in half, take the average of those two groups, and there's our four colors for our posterized cornflower. Let's try and apply that to a more complicated texture. Deep Slate Copper Ore is what got my attention initially when I was playing around with quantization. It's mostly gray, but the orange and green are also very important. Let's see what we get when we perform median cut on it. Dividing it into two gives us this miserable gray color. If we keep dividing it into three or four, it just keeps looking horrible. If we compare it to the original, I don't think it does a good job capturing any of the colors. Median cut is basically just breaking down the image into equal bins of pixels. Less abundant colors are just overlooked. They will just be divided up into the bigger colors and affect them as well. This method works well on real images that have thousands of colors. With images, you are normally reducing the number of unique colors down to something like 256. Minecraft textures, on the other hand, are starting with only a few dozen colors at most. And that's one of the things that makes this problem difficult. We're actually dealing with a very small data set. So let's look at a popular method used for dealing with clusters of data, k-means. We will load the deep slate copper ore texture into OKLab, OK and the colors are scaled based on their abundance. k-means starts by randomly selecting points equal to the number of clusters you want to end with. I chose four for this example, and just ignore the colors of the clusters. They are just there to distinguish between them. To start, a cluster calculates its distance to every other point in the data. I'm just gonna show this with lines, and every cluster does this. A point is assigned to a cluster based on whichever one it's closest to. And then the mean of each cluster is calculated and the cluster center moves to that new location. And this will keep iterating until the clusters have stopped moving. For our example here, it will take five iterations. The final cluster location is the color of all of the pixels assigned to it. And our final image isn't that bad. If we added up all the distances from each cluster to their points, we would get a value. For this one here, it's 53.83. But since we started with random points, you won't end up with the same result each time. The k-mean process is repeated over and over, and the lowest value is assumed to be the best. I ran it 10 times, and this is just five of them, but the last one here was the shortest distance. I would prefer to have a technique that is consistent. And another downside of many quantization techniques is that you need to know the number of colors you are wanting to end with. There are some techniques that you can use to help determine the appropriate number of clusters, but I haven't had much success with those, primarily due to the fact that we don't have much data to work with. And this is basically where I was a few months ago. I ended up making a post in the Color Theory channel on my Discord complaining about these issues, and I just planned to get back to it at some other time. But soon after that, a Discord member, Nert, posted some tests using mean shift clustering, and it was perfect. So let's talk about mean shift clustering and what makes it so good. Let's start with the orange values. Before it runs, it looks at all the data and does a kernel density estimation. You can just think of it as a smaller area it will look at while it's clustering. For our example, it's about 19 blocks across. It starts at a point of data and looks at the area inside the sphere and calculates its center of mass. This is just the mean average. It moves the cluster to that location and does the same thing again. 
The lower orange color is now in range, so the center of mass moves down lower. Nothing new entered or left the sphere when it moved, so it's done moving. And then it goes on to the next data point. Calculates the center of mass, moves there, nothing entered or left, so it's done. It shares the same endpoint as the previous data point, so they are both in the same cluster. Then it goes into the bottom orange data. The center of mass is pulled upwards, and it ends up settling at the same point as the other two values. This point is the maxima of density and represents all of our orange values. We can continue this for the rest of the data, and all of those that share a common endpoint belong to the same cluster. We end up with four clusters for deep slate, and if we remap those clusters to pixels, we have this result, which I think is incredibly good. Some of the reasons why this method works so well for us is that the clusters aren't based on trying to reduce total distance. The clusters can be any size, and you can have points that are near each other, but still get pulled into separate clusters. And earlier I said mode would not be important for us, but mean shift clustering is actually a mode syncing density function. It's trying to find the most dense parts of the data. You can mess with a few settings in it, like how it determines the kernel estimation, but the default seems to work really well. Let's look at some of the other problem children. These other blocks' distinctive colors are represented very well. Let me set this right. The four red pixels of a powered bulb are not absorbed into the other colors of the block. The birch is mostly white, and what you would use in a build instead of gray. The orange terracotta looks exactly like I wanted earlier. I didn't even cheat on this, by the way. The earlier one that I made over there, I just averaged myself in GIMP. And then the TNT is red and white and not pink. So overall, incredibly good. But uh, what's going on with the red carpet? Let's talk about a few of the downsides. Wet sponge is another block that doesn't change at all. I was surprised when I did this, but the red wool texture actually has 36 shades of red in it. They're all very close to each other, so when the bandwidth is selected, it's small and they still get clustered together. This actually has four different colors, but it really is not that much difference. Mean shift clustering has issues if all of your points are very close together, which if they are, then those other averaging techniques are probably gonna better suit you. The sponge, however, only has four colors to begin with, and they're a little bit spaced apart, so essentially they are already clustered. You could get a better result by looking at how close the final clusters are, and then if they are under some value, just merge those clusters together. I did that here for anything closer than five meters, and there's still no change on the sponge, but the red wool is basically one color now. You could increase it to 10, and then you get some change on the sponge, but at that point, you're just averaging everything together almost. So what this means for Minecraft is that after mean shifting a texture, the color with the most pixels is the dominant color. And in the next version of the color world, I'll be changing median color to mean shifted dominant color. I also have a lot of other big changes planned for the color world that I'm very excited about. I was curious what all these textures would look like in game, so I made a resource pack with them. This version combines clusters that are close together, and it seems I inadvertently remade the bare bones resource pack, which is similar to the one that Moyang uses for its promotional material. If you're interested, I've included a link to download it. It includes every block, even the new ones with resin, Sniffer egg, there's our corn flour, and other foliage as well. Even though this wasn't a very long episode, it took a lot of work to put together. And I would like to thank Noel, whom I have been working with to create some tools to help me make the visuals I use here. I also want to thank Nert again for introducing me to mean shift clustering, and they have done a lot of other very cool things over on the Discord that might show up in future episodes. And lastly, a big thank you to my patrons. Your support will lead to some pretty cool things here. I hope you all have a nice day. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I also started using Flashback, a replay style mod created by Mulberry, who also made Axiom. It's just amazing, of course.